The Word was first. The Word present to God. God present to the Word. The Word was God. In readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through Him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without Him. What came into existence was life. And the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness. The darkness couldn't put it out. There once was a man, his name John, sent by God to point out the way to the life light. He came to show everyone where to look, who to believe in. John was not himself the light, he was there to show the way to the light. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life. He brings into light. He was in the world. The world was there through him. And yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people. But they didn't want him. But whoever did want him. Who believed he was who he claimed. And would do what he said. He made to be their true selves. Their child of God selves. These are the God begotten. Not blood begotten. Not flesh begotten. Not sex begotten. The word became flesh and blood. And moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes. The one of a kind glory. Like father, like son. Generous inside and out. True from start to finish. John pointed him out and called, This is the one. The one I told you was coming after me but in fact was ahead of me. He has always been ahead of me, has always had the first word. We all live off his generous abundance. Gift after gift after gift. We got the basics from Moses. And then this exuberant giving and receiving. This endless knowing and understanding. All this came through Jesus, the Messiah. No one has ever seen God. Not so much as a glimpse. This one-of-a-kind God expression. Who exists at the very heart of the Father. Has made him plain as day. When Jews from Jerusalem sent a group of priests and officials to ask John who he was, he was completely honest. He didn't evade the question. He told the plain truth, I am not the Messiah. They pressed him, who, then? Elijah? I am not. The prophet? No. Exasperated, they said, who? then. We need an answer for those who sent us. Tell us something, anything, about yourself. I'm thunder in the desert, make the road straight for God. I'm doing what the prophet Isaiah preached. Those sent to question him were from the Pharisee party. Now they had a question of their own, if you're neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, why do you baptize? John answered, I only baptize using water. A person you don't recognize has taken his stand in your midst. He comes after me, but he is not in second place to me. I'm not even worthy to hold his coat for him. These conversations took place in Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing at the time. The very next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and yelled out, Here he is, God's Passover Lamb. He forgives the sins of the world. This is the man I've been talking about, the one who comes after me but is really ahead of me. I knew nothing about who he was, only this, that my task has been to get Israel ready to recognize him as the God Revealer. That is why I came here baptizing with water, giving you a good bath and scrubbing sins from your life so you can get a fresh start with God. 
John clinched his witness with this, I watched the spirit, like a dove flying down out of the sky, making himself at home in him. I repeat, I know nothing about him except this, the one who authorized me to baptize with water told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit come down and stay, this one will baptize with the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what I saw happen, and I'm telling you, there's no question about it, this is the Son of God. The next day John was back at his post with two disciples, who were watching. He looked up, saw Jesus walking nearby, and said, Here he is, God's Passover lamb. The two disciples heard him and went after Jesus. Jesus looked over his shoulder and said to them, What are you after? They said, Rabbi, which means, Teacher, where are you staying? He replied, Come along and see for yourself. They came, saw where he was living, and ended up staying with him for the day. It was late afternoon when this happened. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John's witness and followed Jesus. The first thing he did after finding where Jesus lived was find his own brother, Simon, telling him, we found the Messiah, that is, Christ. He immediately led him to Jesus. Jesus took one look up and said, You're John's son, Simon. From now on your name is Cephas, or Peter, which means rock. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. When he got there, he ran across Philip and said, Come, follow me. Philip's hometown was Bethsaida, the same as Andrew and Peter. Philip went and found Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses wrote of in the law, the one preached by the prophets. It's Jesus, Joseph's son, the one from Nazareth. Nathanael said, Nazareth? You've got to be kidding. But Philip said, Come, see for yourself. When Jesus saw him coming he said, There's a real Israelite not a false bone in his body. Nathanael said, Where did you get that idea? You don't know me. Jesus answered, One day, long before Philip called you here, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, You are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus said, you become a believer simply because I say I saw you one day sitting under the fig tree. You haven't seen anything yet. Before this is over you're going to see heaven open and God's angels descending to the Son of Man and ascending again. Three days later there was a wedding in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were guests also. When they started running low on wine at the wedding banquet, Jesus' mother told him, they're just about out of wine. Jesus said, is that any of our business, mother, yours or mine? This isn't my time. Don't push me. She went ahead anyway, telling the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. Six stoneware water pots were there used by the Jews for ritual washings. Each held twenty to thirty gallons. Jesus ordered the servants, fill the pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. Now fill your pitchers and take them to the host, Jesus said, and they did. When the host tasted the water that had become wine, he didn't know what had just happened but the servants, of course, knew, he called out to the bridegroom, Everybody I know begins with their finest wines and after the guests have had their fill brings in the cheap stuff. But you've saved the best till now. This act in Cana of Galilee was the first sign Jesus gave, the first glimpse of his glory. And his disciples believed in him. After this he went down to Capernaum along with his mother, brothers, and disciples, and stayed several days. When the Passover feast, 
celebrated each spring by the Jews, was about to take place, Jesus traveled up to Jerusalem. He found the temple teeming with people selling cattle and sheep and doves. The lone sharks were also there in full strength. Jesus put together a whip out of strips of leather and chased them out of the temple, stampeding the sheep and cattle, appending the tables of the lone sharks, spilling coins left and right. He told the dove merchants, Get your things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a shopping mall. That's when his disciples remembered the scripture, Zeal for your house consumes me. But the Jews were upset. They asked, What credentials can you present to justify this? Jesus answered, Tear down this temple and in three days I'll put it back together. They were indignant, It took forty-six years to build this temple, and you're going to rebuild it in three days? But Jesus was talking about his body as the temple. Later, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this. They then put two and two together and believed both what was written in scripture and what Jesus had said. During the time he was in Jerusalem, those days of the Passover feast, Many people noticed the signs he was displaying and, seeing they pointed straight to God, entrusted their lives to him. But Jesus didn't entrust his life to them. He knew them inside and out, knew how untrustworthy they were. He didn't need any help in seeing right through them. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. No one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in on it. Jesus said, You're absolutely right. Take it from me, unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grown up. You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born from above talk? Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water, creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within is formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit, and becomes a living spirit. So don't be so surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above, by the wind of God, the Spirit of God. Nicodemus asked, What do you mean by this? How does this happen? Jesus said, you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't know these basics. Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only of what I know by experience, I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. There is nothing secondhand here, no hearsay. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you of things you can't see, the things of God? No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up and everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. 
This is how much God loved the world, he gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed, by believing in him anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted, anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis wherein, God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes Godlight so the work can be seen for the God work it is. After this conversation, Jesus went on with his disciples into the Judean countryside and relaxed with them there. He was also baptizing. At the same time, John was baptizing over at Anon near Salim, where water was abundant. This was before John was thrown into jail. John's disciples got into an argument with the establishment Jews over the nature of baptism. They came to John and said, Rabbi, you know the one who was with you on the other side of the Jordan? The one you authorized with your witness? Well, he's now competing with us. He's baptizing, too, and everyone's going to him instead of us. John answered, it's not possible for a person to succeed, I'm talking about eternal success, without heaven's help. You yourselves were there when I made it public that I was not the Messiah but simply the one sent ahead of him to get things ready. The one who gets the bride is, by definition, the bridegroom. And the bridegroom's friend, his, best man, that's me in place at his side where he can hear every word, is genuinely happy. How could he be jealous when he knows that the wedding is finished and the marriage is off to a good start? That's why my cup is running over. This is the assigned moment for him to move into the center, while I slip off to the sidelines. The one who comes from above is head and shoulders over other messengers from God. The earthborn is earthbound and speaks earth language, the heavenborn is in a league of his own. He sets out the evidence of what he saw and heard in heaven. No one wants to deal with these facts. But anyone who examines this evidence will come to stake his life on this, that God himself is the truth. The one that God sent speaks God's words. And don't think he rations out the Spirit in bits and pieces. The Father loves the Son extravagantly. He turned everything over to him so he could give it away, a lavish distribution of gifts. That is why whoever accepts and trusts the Son gets in on everything, life complete and forever. And that is also why the person who avoids and distrusts the Son is in the dark and doesn't see life. All he experiences of God is darkness, and an angry darkness at that. Jesus realized that the Pharisees were keeping count of the baptisms that he and John performed, although his disciples, not Jesus, did the actual baptizing. They had posted the score that Jesus was ahead, turning him and John into rivals in the eyes of the people. So Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. To get there, he had to pass through Samaria. He came into Sichar, a Samaritan village that bordered the field Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. It was noon. A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. 
Jesus said, Would you give me a drink of water? His disciples had gone to the village to buy food for lunch. The Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, How come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you would be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh, living water. The woman said, Sir, you don't even have a bucket to draw with, and this well is deep. So how are you going to get this living water? Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it, he and his sons and livestock, and passed it down to us? Jesus said, Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artesian spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so I won't ever get thirsty, won't ever have to come back to this well again. He said, Go call your husband and then come back. I have no husband, she said. That's nicely put, I have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now isn't even your husband. You spoke the truth there, sure enough. Oh, so you're a prophet. Well, tell me this, our ancestors worshipped God at this mountain, but you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place for worship, right? Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here at this mountain nor there in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark, we Jews worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews. But the time is coming, it has, in fact, come, when what you're called will not matter and where you go to worship will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is out looking for, those who are simply and honestly themselves before Him in their worship. God is sheer being itself, Spirit. Those who worship Him must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves, in adoration. The woman said, I don't know about that. I do know that the Messiah is coming. When he arrives, we'll get the whole story. I am he, said Jesus. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked. They couldn't believe he was talking with that kind of a woman. No one said what they were all thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and left. In her confusion she left her water pot. Back in the village she told the people, Come see a man who knew all about the things I did, who knows me inside and out. Do you think this could be the Messiah? And they went out to see for themselves. In the meantime, the disciples pressed him, Rabbi, eat. Aren't you going to eat? He told them, I have food to eat you know nothing about. The disciples were puzzled. Who could have brought him food? Jesus said, The food that keeps me going is that I do the will of the one who sent me, finishing the work he started. As you look around right now, wouldn't you say that in about four months it will be time to harvest? Well, I'm telling you to open your eyes and take a good look at what's right in front of you. These Samaritan fields are ripe. It's harvest time. The harvester isn't waiting. He's taking his pay, gathering in this grain that's ripe for eternal life. Now the sower is arm in arm with the harvester, triumphant. That's the truth of the saying, this one sows, that one harvests. 
I sent you to harvest a field you never worked. Without lifting a finger, you have walked in on a field worked long and hard by others. Many of the Samaritans from that village committed themselves to him because of the woman's witness, he knew all about the things I did. He knows me inside and out. They asked him to stay on, so Jesus stayed two days. A lot more people entrusted their lives to him when they heard what he had to say. They said to the woman, We're no longer taking this on your say-so. We've heard it for ourselves and know it for sure. He's the Savior of the world. After the two days he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus knew well from experience that a prophet is not respected in the place where he grew up. So when he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, but only because they were impressed with what he had done in Jerusalem during the Passover feast, not that they really had a clue about who he was or what he was up to. Now he was back in Cana of Galilee, the place where he made the water into wine. Meanwhile in Capernaum, there was a certain official from the king's court whose son was sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and asked that he come down and heal his son, who was on the brink of death. Jesus put him off, unless you people are dazzled by a miracle, you refuse to believe. But the court official wouldn't be put off. Come down. It's life or death for my son. Jesus simply replied, go home. Your son lives. The man believed the bare word Jesus spoke and headed home. On his way back, his servants intercepted him and announced, Your son lives. He asked them what time he began to get better. They said, The fever broke yesterday afternoon at one o'clock. The father knew that that was the very moment Jesus had said, Your son lives. That settled it. Not only he but his entire household believed. This was now the second sign Jesus gave after having come from Judea into Galilee. Soon another feast came around and Jesus was back in Jerusalem. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem there was a pool, in Hebrew called Bethesda, with five alcoves. Hundreds of sick people, blind, crippled, paralyzed, were in these alcoves. One man had been an invalid there for thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him stretched out by the pool and knew how long he had been there, he said, Do you want to get well? The sick man said, Sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. By the time I get there, somebody else is already in. Jesus said, Get up, take your bedroll, start walking. The man was healed on the spot. He picked up his bedroll and walked off. That day happened to be the Sabbath. The Jews stopped the healed man and said, It's the Sabbath. You can't carry your bedroll around. It's against the rules. But he told them, The man who made me well told me to. He said, Take your bedroll and start walking. They asked, Who gave you the order to take it up and start walking? But the healed man didn't know, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd. A little later Jesus found him in the temple and said, You look wonderful. You're well. Don't return to a sinning life or something worse might happen. The man went back and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. That is why the Jews were out to get Jesus, because he did this kind of thing on the Sabbath. But Jesus defended himself. My father is working straight through, even on the Sabbath. So am I. That really set them off. The Jews were now not only out to expose him, they were out to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own Father, putting himself on a level with God. 
So Jesus explained himself at length. I'm telling you this straight. The Son can't independently do a thing, only what he sees the Father doing. What the Father does, the Son does. The Father loves the Son and includes him in everything he is doing. But you haven't seen the half of it yet, for in the same way that the Father raises the dead and creates life, so does the Son. The Son gives life to anyone he chooses. Neither he nor the Father shuts anyone out. The Father handed all authority to judge over to the Son so that the Son will be honored equally with the Father. Anyone who dishonors the Son, dishonors the Father, for it was the Father's decision to put the Son in the place of honor. It's urgent that you listen carefully to this, anyone here who believes what I am saying right now and aligns himself with the Father, who has in fact put me in charge, has at this very moment the real, lasting life and is no longer condemned to be an outsider. This person has taken a giant step from the world of the dead to the world of the living. It's urgent that you get this right, the time has arrived, I mean right now, when dead men and women will hear the voice of the Son of God and, hearing, will come alive. Just as the Father has life in Himself, He has conferred on the Son life in Himself. And He has given Him the authority, simply because He is the Son of Man, to decide and carry out matters of judgment. Don't act so surprised at all this. The time is coming when everyone dead and buried will hear His voice. Those who have lived the right way will walk out into a resurrection life, those who have lived the wrong way, into a resurrection judgment. I can't do a solitary thing on my own, I listen, then I decide. You can trust my decision because I'm not out to get my own way but only to carry out orders. If I were simply speaking on my own account, it would be an empty, self-serving witness. But an independent witness confirms me, the most reliable witness of all. Furthermore, you all saw and heard John, and he gave expert and reliable testimony about me, didn't he? But my purpose is not to get your vote, and not to appeal to mere human testimony. I'm speaking to you this way so that you will be saved. John was a torch, blazing and bright, and you were glad enough to dance for an hour or so in his bright light. But the witness that really confirms me far exceeds John's witness. It's the work the Father gave me to complete. These very tasks, as I go about completing them, confirm that the Father, in fact, sent me. The Father who sent me, confirmed me. And you missed it. You never heard His voice, you never saw His appearance. There is nothing left in your memory of His message because you do not take His messenger seriously. You have your heads in your Bibles constantly because you think you'll find eternal life there. But you miss the forest for the trees. These scriptures are all about me. And here I am, standing right before you, and you aren't willing to receive from me the life you say you want. I'm not interested in crowd approval. And do you know why? Because I know you and your crowds. I know that love, especially God's love, is not on your working agenda. I came with the authority of my Father, and you either dismiss me or avoid me. If another came, acting self-important, you would welcome him with open arms. How do you expect to get anywhere with God when you spend all your time jockeying for position with each other, ranking your rivals and ignoring God? But don't think I'm going to accuse you before my Father. Moses, in whom you put so much stock, is your accuser. If you believed, really believed, what Moses said, you would believe me. He wrote of me. If you won't take seriously what he wrote, how can I expect you to take seriously what I speak? After this, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee, 
some call it Tiberius. A huge crowd followed him, attracted by the miracles they had seen him do among the sick. When he got to the other side, he climbed a hill and sat down, surrounded by his disciples. It was nearly time for the feast of Passover, kept annually by the Jews. When Jesus looked out and saw that a large crowd had arrived, he said to Philip, Where can we buy bread to feed these people? He said this to stretch Philip's faith. He already knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, Two hundred silver pieces wouldn't be enough to buy bread for each person to get a piece. One of the disciples, it was Andrew, brother to Simon Peter, said, There's a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But that's a drop in the bucket for a crowd like this. Jesus said, Make the people sit down. There was a nice carpet of green grass in this place. They sat down, about five thousand of them. Then Jesus took the bread and, having given thanks, gave it to those who were seated. He did the same with the fish. All ate as much as they wanted. When the people had eaten their fill, he said to his disciples, Gather the leftovers so nothing is wasted. They went to work and filled twelve large baskets with leftovers from the five barley loaves. The people realized that God was at work among them in what Jesus had just done. They said, This is the prophet for sure, God's prophet right here in Galilee. Jesus saw that in their enthusiasm, they were about to grab him and make him king, so he slipped off and went back up the mountain to be by himself. In the evening his disciples went down to the sea, got in the boat, and headed back across the water to Capernaum. It had grown quite dark and Jesus had not yet returned. A huge wind blew up, churning the sea. They were maybe three or four miles out when they saw Jesus walking on the sea, quite near the boat. They were scared senseless, but he reassured them, it's me. It's all right. Don't be afraid. So they took him on board. In no time they reached land, the exact spot they were headed to. The next day the crowd that was left behind realized that there had been only one boat, and that Jesus had not gotten into it with his disciples. They had seen them go off without him. By now boats from Tiberias had pulled up near where they had eaten the bread blessed by the Master. So when the crowd realized he was gone and wasn't coming back, they piled into the Tiberias boats and headed for Capernaum, looking for Jesus. When they found him back across the sea, they said, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, You've come looking for me not because you saw God in my actions but because I fed you, filled your stomachs, and for free. Don't waste your energy striving for perishable food like that. Work for the food that sticks with you, food that nourishes your lasting life, food the Son of Man provides. He and what he does are guaranteed by God the Father to last. To that they said, Well, what do we do then to get in on God's works? Jesus said, Sign on with the one that God has sent. That kind of a commitment gets you in on God's works. They waffled, Why don't you give us a clue about who you are, just a hint of what's going on? When we see what's up, we'll commit ourselves. Show us what you can do. Moses fed our ancestors with bread in the desert. It says so in the scriptures, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus responded, the real significance of that scripture is not that Moses gave you bread from heaven but that my father is right now offering you bread from heaven, the real bread. The bread of God came down out of heaven and is giving life to the world. They jumped at that, Master, give us this bread, now and forever. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. 
The person who aligns with me hungers no more and thirsts no more, ever. I have told you this explicitly because even though you have seen me in action, you don't really believe me. Every person the Father gives me eventually comes running to me. And once that person is with me, I hold on and don't let go. I came down from heaven not to follow my own agenda but to accomplish the will of the one who sent me. This, in a nutshell, is that will, that everything handed over to me by the Father be completed, not a single detail missed, and at the wrap-up of time I have everything and everyone put together, upright and whole. This is what my Father wants, that anyone who sees the Son and trusts who He is and what He does and then aligns with Him will enter real life, eternal life. My part is to put them on their feet alive and whole at the completion of time. At this, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven, the Jews started arguing over him, isn't this the son of Joseph? Don't we know his father? Don't we know his mother? How can he now say, I came down out of heaven and expect anyone to believe him? Jesus said, don't bicker among yourselves over me. You're not in charge here. The Father who sent me is in charge. He draws people to me, that's the only way you'll ever come. Only then do I do my work, putting people together, setting them on their feet, ready for the end. This is what the prophets meant when they wrote, and then they will all be personally taught by God. Anyone who has spent any time at all listening to the Father, really listening and therefore learning, comes to me to be taught personally, to see it with his own eyes, hear it with his own ears, from me, since I have it firsthand from the Father. No one has seen the Father except the one who has his being alongside the Father, and you can see me. I'm telling you the most solemn and sober truth now, whoever believes in me has real life, eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna bread in the desert and died. But now here is bread that truly comes down out of heaven. Anyone eating this bread will not die, ever. I am the bread, living bread, who came down out of heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live, and forever. The bread that I present to the world so that it can eat and live is myself, this flesh and blood self. At this, the Jews started fighting among themselves, how can this man serve up his flesh for a meal? But Jesus didn't give an inch. Only insofar as you eat and drink flesh and blood, the flesh and blood of the Son of Man, do you have life within you. The one who brings a hearty appetite to this eating and drinking has eternal life and will be fit and ready for the final day. My flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. By eating my flesh and drinking my blood you enter into me and I into you. In the same way that the fully alive Father sent me here and I live because of him, so the one who makes a meal of me lives because of me. This is the bread from heaven. Your ancestors ate bread and later died. Whoever eats this bread will live always. He said these things while teaching in the meeting place in Capernaum. Many among his disciples heard this and said, This is tough teaching, too tough to swallow. Jesus sensed that his disciples were having a hard time with this and said, Does this rattle you completely? What would happen if you saw the Son of Man ascending to where he came from? The Spirit can make life. Sheer muscle and willpower don't make anything happen. Every word I've spoken to you is a spirit word, and so it is life-making. But some of you are resisting, refusing to have any part in this. Jesus knew from the start that some weren't going to risk themselves with him. He knew also who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you earlier that no one is capable of coming to me on his own. 
you get to me only as a gift from the Father. After this, many of his disciples left. They no longer wanted to be associated with him. Then Jesus gave the twelve their chance, Do you also want to leave? Peter replied, Master, to whom would we go? You have the words of real life, eternal life. We've already committed ourselves, confident that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus responded, Haven't I handpicked you, the twelve? Still, one of you is a devil. He was referring to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. This man, one from the twelve, was even then getting ready to betray him. Later Jesus was going about his business in Galilee. He didn't want to travel in Judea because the Jews there were looking for a chance to kill him. It was near the time of tabernacles, a feast observed annually by the Jews. His brothers said, Why don't you leave here and go up to the feast so your disciples can get a good look at the works you do? No one who intends to be publicly known does everything behind the scenes. If you're serious about what you are doing, come out in the open and show the world. His brothers were pushing him like this because they didn't believe in him either. Jesus came back at them, don't pressure me. This isn't my time. It's your time, it's always your time, you have nothing to lose. The world has nothing against you, but it's up in arms against me. It's against me because I expose the evil behind its pretensions. You go ahead, go up to the feast. Don't wait for me. I'm not ready. It's not the right time for me. He said this and stayed on in Galilee. But later, after his family had gone up to the feast, he also went. But he kept out of the way, careful not to draw attention to himself. The Jews were already out looking for him, asking around, where is that man? There was a lot of contentious talk about him circulating through the crowds. Some were saying, he's a good man. But others said, not so. He's selling snake oil. This kind of talk went on in guarded whispers because of the intimidating Jewish leaders. With the feast already half over, Jesus showed up in the temple, teaching. The Jews were impressed, but puzzled, how does he know so much without being schooled? Jesus said, I didn't make this up. What I teach comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who wants to do his will contest this teaching and know whether it's from God or whether I'm making it up. A person making things up tries to make himself look good. But someone trying to honor the one who sent him sticks to the facts and doesn't tamper with reality. It was Moses, wasn't it, who gave you God's law. But none of you are living it. So why are you trying to kill me? The crowd said, you're crazy. Who's trying to kill you? You're demon-possessed. Jesus said, I did one miraculous thing a few months ago, and you're still standing around getting all upset, wondering what I'm up to. Moses prescribed circumcision, originally it came not from Moses but from his ancestors, and so you circumcise a man, dealing with one part of his body, even if it's the Sabbath. You do this in order to preserve one item in the law of Moses. So why are you upset with me because I made a man's whole body well on the Sabbath? Don't be hypercritical, use your head and heart to discern what is right, to test what is authentically right. That's when some of the people of Jerusalem said, isn't this the one they were out to kill? And here he is out in the open, saying whatever he pleases, and no one is stopping him. Could it be that the rulers know that he is, in fact, the Messiah? And yet we know where this man came from. The Messiah is going to come out of nowhere. Nobody is going to know where he comes from. 
That provoked Jesus, who was teaching in the temple, to cry out, Yes, you think you know me and where I'm from, but that's not where I'm from. I didn't set myself up in business. My true origin is in the one who sent me, and you don't know him at all. I come from him, that's how I know him. He sent me here. They were looking for a way to arrest him, but not a hand was laid on him because it wasn't yet God's time. Many from the crowd committed themselves in faith to him, saying, Will the Messiah, when he comes, provide better or more convincing evidence than this? The Pharisees, alarmed at this seditious undertow going through the crowd, teamed up with the high priests and sent their police to arrest him. Jesus rebuffed them, I am with you only a short time. Then I go on to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you won't find me. Where I am, you can't come. The Jews put their heads together. Where do you think he is going that we won't be able to find him? Do you think he is about to travel to the Greek world to teach the Jews? What is he talking about, anyway, you will look for me, but you won't find me, and, where I am, you can't come. On the final and climactic day of the feast, Jesus took his stand. He cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Rivers of living water will brim and spill out of the depths of anyone who believes in me this way, just as the scripture says. He said this in regard to the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were about to receive. The Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Those in the crowd who heard these words were saying, This has to be the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. But others were saying, The Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Don't the scriptures tell us that the Messiah comes from David's line and from Bethlehem, David's village? So there was a split in the crowd over him. Some went so far as wanting to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. That's when the temple police reported back to the high priests and Pharisees, who demanded, why didn't you bring him with you? The police answered, Have you heard the way he talks? We've never heard anyone speak like this man. The Pharisees said, Are you carried away like the rest of the rabble? You don't see any of the leaders believing in him, do you? Or any from the Pharisees? It's only this crowd, ignorant of God's law, that is taken in by him, and damned. Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus earlier and was both a ruler and a Pharisee, spoke up. Does our law decide about a man's guilt without first listening to him and finding out what he is doing? But they cut him off. Are you also campaigning for the Galilean? Examine the evidence. See if any prophet ever comes from Galilee. Then they all went home. Jesus went across to Mount Olives, but he was soon back in the temple again. Swarms of people came to him. He sat down and taught them. The religion scholars and Pharisees led in a woman who had been caught in an act of adultery. They stood her in plain sight of everyone and said, Teacher, this woman was caught red-handed in the act of adultery. Moses, in the law, gives orders to stone such persons. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something incriminating so they could bring charges against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the dirt. They kept at him, badgering him. He straightened up and said, The sinless one among you, go first, throw the stone. Bending down again, he wrote some more in the dirt. Hearing that, they walked away, one after another, beginning with the oldest. The woman was left alone. Jesus stood up and spoke to her. Woman, where are they? Does no one condemn you? No one, Master. 
Neither do I, said Jesus. Go on your way. From now on, don't sin. Note, John 7 53-8-11, the portion in brackets, is not found in the earliest handwritten copies. Jesus once again addressed them, I am the world's light. No one who follows me stumbles around in the darkness. I provide plenty of light to live in. The Pharisees objected, all we have is your word on this. We need more than this to go on. Jesus replied, you're right that you only have my word. But you can depend on it being true. I know where I've come from and where I go next. You don't know where I'm from or where I'm headed. You decide according to what you can see and touch. I don't make judgments like that. But even if I did, my judgment would be true because I wouldn't make it out of the narrowness of my experience but in the largeness of the one who sent me, the Father. That fulfills the condition set down in God's law, that you can count on the testimony of two witnesses. And that is what you have, you have my word and you have the word of the Father who sent me. They said, Where is this so-called Father of yours? Jesus said, You're looking right at me and you don't see me. How do you expect to see the Father? If you knew me, you would at the same time know the Father. He gave this speech in the treasury while teaching in the temple. No one arrested him because his time wasn't yet up. Then he went over the same ground again. I'm leaving and you are going to look for me, but you're missing God in this and are headed for a dead end. There is no way you can come with me. The Jews said, so, is he going to kill himself? Is that what he means by, you can't come with me? Jesus said, you're tied down to the mundane. I'm in touch with what is beyond your horizons. You live in terms of what you see and touch. I'm living on other terms. I told you that you were missing God in all this. You're at a dead end. If you won't believe I am who I say I am, you're at the dead end of sins. You're missing God in your lives. They said to him, Just who are you anyway? Jesus said, what I've said from the start. I have so many things to say that concern you, judgments to make that affect you, but if you don't accept the trustworthiness of the one who commanded my words and acts, none of it matters. That is who you are questioning, not me but the one who sent me. They still didn't get it, didn't realize that he was referring to the Father. So Jesus tried again. When you raise up the Son of Man, then you will know who I am, that I'm not making this up, but speaking only what the Father taught me. The one who sent me stays with me. He doesn't abandon me. He sees how much joy I take in pleasing him. When he put it in these terms, many people decided to believe. Then Jesus turned to the Jews who had claimed to believe in him. If you stick with this, living out what I tell you, you are my disciples for sure. Then you will experience for yourselves the truth, and the truth will free you. Surprised, they said, but we're descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. How can you say, the truth will free you? Jesus said, I tell you most solemnly that anyone who chooses a life of sin is trapped in a dead-end life and is, in fact, a slave. A slave can't come and go at will. The son, though, has an established position, the run of the house. So if the son sets you free, you are free through and through. I know you are Abraham's descendants. But I also know that you are trying to kill me because my message hasn't yet penetrated your thick skulls. I'm talking about things I have seen while keeping company with the Father, and you just go on doing what you have heard from your Father. They were indignant. 
Our father is Abraham. Jesus said, If you were Abraham's children, you would have been doing the things Abraham did. And yet here you are trying to kill me, a man who has spoken to you the truth he got straight from God. Abraham never did that sort of thing. You persist in repeating the works of your father. They said, We're not bastards. We have a legitimate father, the one and only God. If God were your father, said Jesus, you would love me, for I came from God and arrived here. I didn't come on my own. He sent me. Why can't you understand one word I say? Here's why, you can't handle it. You're from your father, the devil, and all you want to do is please him. He was a killer from the very start. He couldn't stand the truth because there wasn't a shred of truth in him. When the liar speaks, he makes it up out of his lying nature and fills the world with lies. I arrive on the scene, tell you the plain truth, and you refuse to have a thing to do with me. Can any one of you convict me of a single misleading word, a single sinful act? But if I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone on God's side listens to God's words. This is why you're not listening, because you're not on God's side. The Jews then said, that settles it. We were right all along when we called you a Samaritan and said you were crazy, demon-possessed. Jesus said, I'm not crazy. I simply honor my father, while you dishonor me. I am not trying to get anything for myself. God intends something gloriously grand here and is making the decisions that will bring it about. I say this with absolute confidence. If you practice what I'm telling you, you'll never have to look death in the face. At this point the Jews said, now we know you're crazy. Abraham died. The prophets died. And you show up saying, if you practice what I'm telling you, you'll never have to face death, not even a taste. Are you greater than Abraham, who died? And the prophets died. Who do you think you are? Jesus said, if I were striving to get all the attention, it wouldn't amount to anything. But my father, the same one you say is your father, put me here at this time and place of splendor. You haven't recognized him in this. But I have. If I, in false modesty, said I didn't know what was going on, would be as much of a liar as you are. But I do know, and I am doing what he says. Abraham, your father, with elated faith looked down the corridors of history and saw my day coming. He saw it and cheered. The Jews said, you're not even fifty years old, and Abraham saw you. Believe me, said Jesus, I am who I am long before Abraham was anything. That did it pushed them over the edge. They picked up rocks to throw at him. But Jesus slipped away, getting out of the temple. Walking down the street, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, causing him to be born blind? Jesus said, You're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause effect here. Look instead for what God can do. We need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here, working while the sun shines. When night falls, the workday is over. For as long as I am in the world, there is plenty of light. I am the world's light. He said this and then spit in the dust, made a clay paste with the saliva, rubbed the paste on the blind man's eyes, and said, Go, wash at the pool of Siloam, Siloam means, sent. The man went and washed, and saw. Soon the town was buzzing. 
His relatives and those who year after year had seen him as a blind man begging were saying, Why, isn't this the man we knew, who sat here and begged? Others said, It's him all right. But others objected, It's not the same man at all. It just looks like him. He said, It's me, the very one. They said, How did your eyes get opened? A man named Jesus made a paste and rubbed it on my eyes and told me, Go to Salome and wash. I did what he said. When I washed, I saw. So where is he? I don't know. They marched the man to the Pharisees. This day when Jesus made the paste and healed his blindness was the Sabbath. The Pharisees grilled him again on how he had come to see. He said, He put a clay paste on my eyes, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, Obviously, this man can't be from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Others countered, How can a bad man do miraculous, God-revealing things like this? There was a split in their ranks. They came back at the blind man, you're the expert. He opened your eyes. What do you say about him? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews didn't believe it, didn't believe the man was blind to begin with. So they called the parents of the man now bright-eyed with sight. They asked them, is this your son, the one you say was born blind? So how is it that he now sees? His parents said, We know he is our son, and we know he was born blind. But we don't know how he came to see, haven't a clue about who opened his eyes. Why don't you ask him? He's a grown man and can speak for himself. His parents were talking like this because they were intimidated by the Jewish leaders, who had already decided that anyone who took a stand that this was the Messiah would be kicked out of the meeting place. That's why his parents said, ask him. He's a grown man. They called the man back a second time, the man who had been blind, and told him, give credit to God. We know this man is an imposter. He replied, I know nothing about that one way or the other. But I know one thing for sure, I was blind. I now see. They said, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I've told you over and over and you haven't listened. Why do you want to hear it again? Are you so eager to become his disciples? With that they jumped all over him. You might be a disciple of that man, but were disciples of Moses. We know for sure that God spoke to Moses, but we have no idea where this man even comes from. The man replied, This is amazing. You claim to know nothing about him, but the fact is, he opened my eyes. It's well known that God isn't at the beck and call of sinners, but listens carefully to anyone who lives in reverence and does his will. That someone opened the eyes of a man born blind has never been heard of, ever. If this man didn't come from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. They said, you're nothing but dirt. How dare you take that tone with us? Then they threw him out in the street. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and went and found him. He asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man said, Point him out to me, sir, so that I can believe in him. Jesus said, You're looking right at him. Don't you recognize my voice? Master, I believe, the man said, and worshipped him. Jesus then said, I came into the world to bring everything into the clear light of day, making all the distinctions clear, so that those who have never seen will see, and those who have made a great pretense of seeing will be exposed as blind. Some Pharisees overheard him and said, Does that mean you're calling us blind? 
Jesus said, If you were really blind, you would be blameless, but since you claim to see everything so well, you're accountable for every fault and failure. Let me set this before you as plainly as I can. If a person climbs over or through the fence of a sheep pen instead of going through the gate, you know he's up to no good, a sheep rustler. The shepherd walks right up to the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate to him and the sheep recognize his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he gets them all out, he leads them and they follow because they are familiar with his voice. They won't follow a stranger's voice but will scatter because they aren't used to the sound of it. Jesus told this simple story, but they had no idea what he was talking about. So he tried again. I'll be explicit, then. I am the gate for the sheep. All those others are up to no good, sheep rustlers, every one of them. But the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Anyone who goes through me will be cared for, will freely go in and out, and find pasture. A thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd puts the sheep before himself, sacrifices himself if necessary. A hired man is not a real shepherd. The sheep mean nothing to him. He sees a wolf come and runs for it, leaving the sheep to be ravaged and scattered by the wolf. He's only in it for the money. The sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and my own sheep know me. In the same way, the Father knows me and I know the Father. I put the sheep before myself, sacrificing myself if necessary. You need to know that I have other sheep in addition to those in this pen. I need to gather and bring them, too. They'll also recognize my voice. Then it will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I freely lay down my life. And so I am free to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own free will. I have the right to lay it down, I also have the right to take it up again. I receive this authority personally from my father. This kind of talk caused another split in the Jewish ranks. A lot of them were saying, he's crazy, a maniac, out of his head completely. Why bother listening to him? But others weren't so sure, these aren't the words of a crazy man. Can a maniac open blind eyes? They were celebrating Hanukkah just then in Jerusalem. It was winter. Jesus was strolling in the temple across Solomon's porch. The Jews, circling him, said, How long are you going to keep us guessing? If you're the Messiah, tell us straight out. Jesus answered, I told you, but you don't believe. Everything I have done has been authorized by my Father, actions that speak louder than words. You don't believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep recognize my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them real and eternal life. They are protected from the destroyer for good. No one can steal them from out of my hand. The Father who put them under my care is so much greater than the destroyer and thief. No one could ever get them away from him. I and the Father are one heart and mind. Again the Jews picked up rocks to throw at him. Jesus said, I have made a present to you from the Father of a great many good actions. For which of these acts do you stone me? The Jews said, we're not stoning you for anything good you did, but for what you said, this blasphemy of calling yourself God. Jesus said, 
I'm only quoting your inspired scriptures, where God said, I tell you, you are gods. If God called your ancestors gods, and scripture doesn't lie, why do you yell, blasphemer? Blasphemer, at the unique one the Father consecrated and sent into the world, just because I said, I am the Son of God. If I don't do the things my Father does, well and good, don't believe me. But if I am doing them, put aside for a moment what you hear me say about myself and just take the evidence of the actions that are right before your eyes. Then perhaps things will come together for you, and you'll see that not only are we doing the same thing, we are the same, Father and Son. He is in me, I am in him. They tried yet again to arrest him, but he slipped through their fingers. He went back across the Jordan to the place where John first baptized, and stayed there. A lot of people followed him over. They were saying, John did no miracles, but everything he said about this man has come true. Many believed in him then and there. A man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the same Mary who massaged the Lord's feet with aromatic oils and then wiped them with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Master, the one you love so very much is sick. When Jesus got the message, he said, This sickness is not fatal. It will become an occasion to show God's glory by glorifying God's Son. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, but oddly, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed on where he was for two more days. After the two days, he said to his disciples, Let's go back to Judea. They said, Rabbi, you can't do that. The Jews are out to kill you, and you're going back. Jesus replied, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in daylight doesn't stumble because there's plenty of light from the sun. Walking at night, he might very well stumble because he can't see where he's going. He said these things, and then announced, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I'm going to wake him up. The disciples said, Master, if he's gone to sleep, he'll get a good rest and wake up feeling fine. Jesus was talking about death, while his disciples thought he was talking about taking a nap. Then Jesus became explicit, Lazarus died. And I am glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. You're about to be given new grounds for believing. Now let's go to him. That's when Thomas, the one called the twin, said to his companions, Come along. We might as well die with him. When Jesus finally got there, he found Lazarus already four days dead. Bethany was near Jerusalem, only a couple of miles away, and many of the Jews were visiting Martha and Mary, sympathizing with them over their brother. Martha heard Jesus was coming and went out to meet him. Mary remained in the house. Martha said, Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask God he will give you. Jesus said, Your brother will be raised up. Martha replied, I know that he will be raised up in the resurrection at the end of time. You don't have to wait for the end. I am, right now, resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? Yes, Master. All along I have believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. After saying this, she went to her sister Mary and whispered in her ear, The teacher is here and is asking for you. The moment she heard that, she jumped up and ran out to him. 
Jesus had not yet entered the town but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When her sympathizing Jewish friends saw Mary run off, they followed her, thinking she was on her way to the tomb to weep there. Mary came to where Jesus was waiting and fell at his feet, saying, Master, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews with her sobbing, a deep anger welled up within him. He said, Where did you put him? Master, come and see, they said. Now Jesus wept. The Jews said, Look how deeply he loved him. Others among them said, Well, if he loved him so much, why didn't he do something to keep him from dying? After all, he opened the eyes of a blind man. Then Jesus, the anger again welling up within him, arrived at the tomb. It was a simple cave in the hillside with a slab of stone laid against it. Jesus said, Remove the stone. The sister of the dead man, Martha, said, Master, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead four days. Jesus looked her in the eye. Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Then, to the others, go ahead, take away the stone. They removed the stone. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and prayed, Father, I'm grateful that you have listened to me. I know you always do listen, but on account of this crowd standing here I've spoken so that they might believe that you sent me. Then he shouted, Lazarus, come out. And he came out, a cadaver, wrapped from head to toe, and with a kerchief over his face. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him loose. That was a turning point for many of the Jews who were with Mary. They saw what Jesus did, and believed in him. But some went back to the Pharisees and told on Jesus. The high priests and Pharisees called a meeting of the Jewish ruling body. What do we do now? they asked. This man keeps on doing things, creating God signs. If we let him go on, pretty soon everyone will be believing in him and the Romans will come and remove what little power and privilege we still have. Then one of them, it was Caiaphas, the designated chief priest that year, spoke up, Don't you know anything? Can't you see that it's to our advantage that one man dies for the people rather than the whole nation be destroyed? He didn't say this of his own accord, but as chief priest that year he unwittingly prophesied that Jesus was about to die sacrificially for the nation, and not only for the nation but so that all God's exile scattered children might be gathered together into one people. From that day on, they plotted to kill him. So Jesus no longer went out in public among the Jews. He withdrew into the country bordering the desert to a town called Ephraim and secluded himself there with his disciples. The Jewish Passover was coming up. Crowds of people were making their way from the country up to Jerusalem to get themselves ready for the feast. They were curious about Jesus. There was a lot of talk of him among those standing around in the temple, what do you think? Do you think he'll show up at the feast or not? Meanwhile, the high priests and Pharisees gave out the word that anyone who knew his whereabouts should inform them. They were all set to arrest him. Six days before Passover, Jesus entered Bethany where Lazarus, so recently raised from the dead, was living. Lazarus and his sisters invited Jesus to dinner at their home. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those sitting at the table with them. Mary came in with a jar of very expensive aromatic oils, anointed and massaged Jesus' feet, and then wiped them with her hair. The fragrance of the oils filled the house. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, even then getting ready to betray him, said, Why wasn't this oil sold and the money given to the poor? 
it would have easily brought 300 silver pieces. He said this not because he cared two cents about the poor but because he was a thief. He was in charge of their common funds, but also embezzled them. Jesus said, Let her alone. She's anticipating and honoring the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you. You don't always have me. Word got out among the Jews that he was back in town. The people came to take a look, not only at Jesus but also at Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead. So the high priests plotted to kill Lazarus because so many of the Jews were going over and believing in Jesus on account of him. The next day the huge crowd that had arrived for the feast heard that Jesus was entering Jerusalem. They broke off palm branches and went out to meet him. And they cheered. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in God's name. Yes! The King of Israel. Jesus got a young donkey and rode it, just as the scripture has it. No fear, daughter Zion. See how your king comes. Riding a donkey's colt. The disciples didn't notice the fulfillment of many scriptures at the time, but after Jesus was glorified, they remembered that what was written about him matched what was done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, was there giving eyewitness accounts. It was because they had spread the word of this latest God sign that the crowd swelled to a welcoming parade. The Pharisees took one look and threw up their hands, it's out of control. The world's in a stampede after him. There were some Greeks in town who had come up to worship at the feast. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Can you help us? Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip together told Jesus. Jesus answered, Time's up. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Listen carefully, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. If any of you wants to serve me, then follow me. Then you'll be where I am, ready to serve at a moment's notice. The Father will honor and reward anyone who serves me. Right now I am shaken. And what am I going to say? Father, get me out of this. No, this is why I came in the first place. I'll say, Father, put your glory on display. A voice came out of the sky, I have glorified it, and I'll glorify it again. The listening crowd said, Thunder. Others said, An angel spoke to him. Jesus said, The voice didn't come for me but for you. At this moment the world is in crisis. Now Satan, the ruler of this world, will be thrown out. And I, as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. He put it this way to show how he was going to be put to death. Voices from the crowd answered, We heard from God's law that the Messiah lasts forever. How can it be necessary, as you put it, that the Son of Man be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said, For a brief time still, the light is among you. Walk by the light you have so darkness doesn't destroy you. If you walk in darkness, you don't know where you're going. As you have the light, believe in the light. Then the light will be within you, and shining through your lives. You'll be children of light. Jesus said all this, and then went into hiding. 
All these God signs he had given them and they still didn't get it, still wouldn't trust him. This proved that the prophet Isaiah was right. God, who believed what we preached. Who recognized God's arm, outstretched and ready to act. First they wouldn't believe, then they couldn't, again, just as Isaiah said. Their eyes are blinded. Their hearts are hardened. So that they wouldn't see with their eyes. And perceive with their hearts. And turn to me, God. So I could heal them. Isaiah said these things after he got a glimpse of God's overflowing glory that would pour through the Messiah. On the other hand, a considerable number from the ranks of the leaders did believe. But because of the Pharisees, they didn't come out in the open with it. They were afraid of getting kicked out of the meeting place. When push came to shove they cared more for human approval than for God's glory. Jesus summed it all up when he cried out, Whoever believes in me, believes not just in me but in the one who sent me. Whoever looks at me is looking, in fact, at the one who sent me. I am light that has come into the world so that all who believe in me won't have to stay any longer in the dark. If anyone hears what I am saying and doesn't take it seriously, I don't reject him. I didn't come to reject the world, I came to save the world. But you need to know that whoever puts me off, refusing to take in what I'm saying, is willfully choosing rejection. The word, the word made flesh that I have spoken and that I am, that word and no other is the last word. I'm not making any of this up on my own. The Father who sent me gave me orders, told me what to say and how to say it. And I know exactly what his command produces, real and eternal life. That's all I have to say. What the Father told me, I tell you. Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come to leave this world to go to the Father. Having loved his dear companions, he continued to love them right to the end. It was supper time. The devil by now had Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot, firmly in his grip, all set for the betrayal. Jesus knew that the Father had put him in complete charge of everything, that he came from God and was on his way back to God. So he got up from the supper table, set aside his robe, and put on an apron. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. When he got to Simon Peter, Peter said, Master, you wash my feet? Jesus answered, You don't understand now what I'm doing, but it will be clear enough to you later. Peter persisted, You're not going to wash my feet, ever. Jesus said, If I don't wash you, you can't be part of what I'm doing. Master, said Peter. Not only my feet, then. Wash my hands. Wash my head. Jesus said, If you've had a bath in the morning, you only need your feet washed now and you're clean from head to toe. My concern, you understand, is holiness, not hygiene. So now you're clean. But not every one of you. He knew who was betraying him. That's why he said, not every one of you. After he had finished washing their feet, he took his robe, put it back on, and went back to his place at the table. Then he said, Do you understand what I have done to you? You address me as, Teacher and Master, and rightly so. That is what I am. So if I, the Master and Teacher, washed your feet, you must now wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. A servant is not ranked above his master, an employee doesn't give orders to the employer. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it, and live a blessed life.
I'm not including all of you in this. I know precisely whom I have selected, so as not to interfere with the fulfillment of this scripture. The one who ate bread at my table will stab me in the back. I'm telling you all this ahead of time so that when it happens you will believe that I am who I say I am. Make sure you get this right, receiving someone I send is the same as receiving me, just as receiving me is the same as receiving the one who sent me. After he said these things, Jesus became visibly upset, and then he told them why. One of you is going to betray me. The disciples looked around at one another, wondering who on earth he was talking about. One of the disciples, the one Jesus loved dearly, was reclining against him, his head on his shoulder. Peter motioned to him to ask who Jesus might be talking about. So, being the closest, he said, Master, who? Jesus said, The one to whom I give this crust of bread after I've dipped it. Then he dipped the crust and gave it to Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot. As soon as the bread was in his hand, Satan entered him. What you must do, said Jesus, do. Do it and get it over with. No one around the supper table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that since Judas was their treasurer, Jesus was telling him to buy what they needed for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Judas, with the piece of bread, left. It was night. When he had left, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is seen for who he is, and God seen for who he is in him. The moment God is seen in him, God's glory will be on display. In glorifying him, he himself is glorified, glory all around. Children, I am with you for only a short time longer. You are going to look high and low for me. But just as I told the Jews, I'm telling you, where I go, you are not able to come. Let me give you a new command, love one another. In the same way I loved you, you love one another. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples, when they see the love you have for each other. Simon Peter asked, Master, just where are you going? Jesus answered, You can't now follow me where I'm going. You will follow later. Master, said Peter, why can't I follow now? I'll lay down my life for you. Really? You'll lay down your life for me. The truth is that before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Don't let this rattle you. You trust God, don't you? Trust me. There is plenty of room for you in my father's home. If that weren't so, would I have told you that I'm on my way to get a room ready for you? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so you can live where I live. And you already know the road I'm taking. Thomas said, Master, we have no idea where you're going. How do you expect us to know the road? Jesus said, I am the road, also the truth, also the life. No one gets to the Father apart from me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. You've even seen him. Philip said, Master, show us the Father, then we'll be content. You've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand. To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you aren't mere words. I don't just make them up on my own. The Father who resides in me crafts each word into a divine act. Believe me, I am in my Father and my Father is in me. If you can't believe that, believe what you see, these works. 
The person who trusts me will not only do what I'm doing but even greater things, because I, on my way to the Father, am giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. You can count on it. From now on, whatever you request along the lines of who I am and what I am doing, I'll do it. That's how the Father will be seen for who He is in the Son. I mean it. Whatever you request in this way, I'll do. If you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. I will talk to the Father, and He'll provide you another friend so that you will always have someone with you. This friend is the Spirit of Truth. The godless world can't take Him in because it doesn't have eyes to see Him, doesn't know what to look for. But you know Him already because He has been staying with you, and will even be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming back. In just a little while the world will no longer see me, but you're going to see me because I am alive and you're about to come alive. At that moment you will know absolutely that I'm in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. The person who knows my commandments and keeps them, that's who loves me. And the person who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and make myself plain to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said, Master, why is it that you are about to make yourself plain to us, but not to the world? Because a loveless world, said Jesus, is a sightless world. If anyone loves me, he will carefully keep my word and my Father will love him, will move right into the neighborhood. Not loving me means not keeping my words. The message you are hearing isn't mine. It's the message of the Father who sent me. I'm telling you these things while I'm still living with you. The friend, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send at my request, will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all the things I have told you. I'm leaving you well and whole. That's my parting gift to you. Peace. I don't leave you the way you're used to being left, feeling abandoned, bereft. So don't be upset. Don't be distraught. You've heard me tell you, I'm going away, and I'm coming back. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm on my way to the Father because the Father is the goal and purpose of my life. I've told you this ahead of time, before it happens, so that when it does happen, the confirmation will deepen your belief in me. I'll not be talking with you much more like this because the chief of this godless world is about to attack. But don't worry, he has nothing on me, no claim on me. But so the world might know how thoroughly I love the Father, I am carrying out my Father's instructions right down to the last detail. Get up. Let's go. It's time to leave here. I am the real vine and my Father is the farmer. He cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grapes. And every branch that is grape-bearing he prunes back so it will bear even more. You are already pruned back by the message I have spoken. Live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my Father shows who He is, when you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. I've loved you the way my Father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. 
If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done, kept my father's commands and made myself at home in his love. I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy, and your joy wholly mature. This is my command, love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. You didn't choose me, remember, I chose you, and put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he gives you. But remember the root command, love one another. If you find the godless world is hating you, remember it got its start hating me. If you lived on the world's terms, the world would love you as one of its own. But since I picked you to live on God's terms and no longer on the world's terms, the world is going to hate you. When that happens, remember this, servants don't get better treatment than their masters. If they beat on me, they will certainly beat on you. If they did what I told them, they will do what you tell them. They are going to do all these things to you because of the way they treated me, because they don't know the one who sent me. If I hadn't come and told them all this in plain language, it wouldn't be so bad. As it is, they have no excuse. Hate me, hate my father, it's all the same. If I hadn't done what I have done among them, works no one has ever done, they wouldn't be to blame. But they saw the God signs and hated anyway, both me and my father. Interesting, they have verified the truth of their own scriptures where it is written, they hated me for no good reason. When the friend I plan to send you from the Father comes, the Spirit of Truth issuing from the Father, he will confirm everything about me. You, too, from your side must give your confirming evidence, since you are in this with me from the start. I've told you these things to prepare you for rough times ahead. They are going to throw you out of the meeting places. There will even come a time when anyone who kills you will think he's doing God a favor. They will do these things because they never really understood the Father. I've told you these things so that when the time comes and they start in on you, you'll be well warned and ready for them. I didn't tell you this earlier because I was with you every day. But now I am on my way to the one who sent me. Not one of you has asked, where are you going? Instead, the longer I've talked, the sadder you've become. So let me say it again, this truth, it's better for you that I leave. If I don't leave, the friend won't come. But if I go, I'll send him to you. When he comes, he'll expose the error of the godless world's view of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He'll show them that their refusal to believe in me is their basic sin, that righteousness comes from above, where I am with the Father, out of their sight and control, that judgment takes place as the ruler of this godless world is brought to trial and convicted. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them now. But when the friend comes, the spirit of the truth, he will take you by the hand and guide you into all the truth there is. He won't draw attention to himself, but will make sense out of what is about to happen and, indeed, out of all that I have done and said. He will honor me, he will take from me and deliver it to you. Everything the Father has is also mine. That is why I have said, he takes from me and delivers to you. In a day or so you're not going to see me, but then in another day or so you will see me. That stirred up a hornet's nest of questions among the disciples, what's he talking about, 
in a day or so you're not going to see me, but then in another day or so you will see me. And, because I'm on my way to the Father. What is this, day or so? We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew they were dying to ask him what he meant, so he said, Are you trying to figure out among yourselves what I meant when I said, In a day or so you're not going to see me, but then in another day or so you will see me? Then fix this firmly in your minds, you're going to be in deep mourning while the godless world throws a party. You'll be sad, very sad, but your sadness will develop into gladness. When a woman gives birth, she has a hard time, there's no getting around it. But when the baby is born, there is joy in the birth. This new life in the world wipes out memory of the pain. The sadness you have right now is similar to that pain, but the coming joy is also similar. When I see you again, you'll be full of joy, and it will be a joy no one can rob from you. You'll no longer be so full of questions. This is what I want you to do, ask the Father for whatever is in keeping with the things I've revealed to you. Ask in my name, according to my will, and he'll most certainly give it to you. Your joy will be a river overflowing its banks. I've used figures of speech in telling you these things. Soon I'll drop the figures and tell you about the Father in plain language. Then you can make your requests directly to Him in relation to this life I've revealed to you. I won't continue making requests of the Father on your behalf. I won't need to. Because you've gone out on a limb, committed yourselves to love and trust in me, believing I came directly from the Father, the Father loves you directly. First, I left the Father and arrived in the world, now I leave the world and travel to the Father. His disciples said, Finally. You're giving it to us straight, in plain talk, no more figures of speech. Now we know that you know everything, it all comes together in you. You won't have to put up with our questions anymore. We're convinced you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you finally believe? In fact, you're about to make a run for it, saving your own skins and abandoning me. But I'm not abandoned. The Father is with me. I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart. I've conquered the world. Jesus said these things. Then, raising his eyes in prayer, he said. Father, it's time. Display the bright splendor of your sun. So the sun in turn may show your bright splendor. You put him in charge of everything human. So he might give real and eternal life to all in his care. And this is the real and eternal life. That they know you. The one and only true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you sent. I glorified you on earth. By completing down to the last detail. What you assigned me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with your very own splendor. The very splendor I had in your presence. Before there was a world. I spelled out your character in detail. To the men and women you gave me. They were yours in the first place. Then you gave them to me. And they have now done what you said. They know now, beyond the shadow of a doubt. That everything you gave me is first hand from you. For the message you gave me, I gave them. And they took it, and were convinced. That I came from you. They believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the God-rejecting world. But for those you gave me. For they are yours by right. 
Everything mine is yours, and yours mine. And my life is on display in them. For I'm no longer going to be visible in the world. They'll continue in the world. While I return to you. Holy Father, guard them as they pursue this life. That you conferred as a gift through me. So they can be one heart and mind. As we are one heart and mind. As long as I was with them, I guarded them. In the pursuit of the life you gave through me. I even posted a lookout. And not one of them got away. Except for the rebel bent on destruction. The exception that proved the rule of scripture. Now I'm returning to you. I'm saying these things in the world's hearing. So my people can experience. My joy completed in them. I gave them your word. The godless world hated them because of it. Because they didn't join the world's ways. Just as I didn't join the world's ways. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world. But that you guard them from the evil one. They are no more defined by the world. Than I am defined by the world. Make them holy, consecrated, with the truth. Your word is consecrating truth. In the same way that you gave me a mission in the world. I give them a mission in the world. I'm consecrating myself for their sakes. So they'll be truth consecrated in their mission. I'm praying not only for them. But also for those who will believe in me. Because of them and their witness about me. The goal is for all of them to become one heart and mind. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So they might be one heart and mind with us. Then the world might believe that you, in fact, sent me. The same glory you gave me, I gave them. So they'll be as unified and together as we are. I in them and you in me. Then they'll be mature in this oneness. And give the godless world evidence. That you've sent me and loved them. In the same way you've loved me. Father, I want those you gave me. To be with me, right where I am. So they can see my glory, the splendor you gave me. Having loved me. Long before there ever was a world. Righteous Father, the world has never known you. But I have known you, and these disciples know. That you sent me on this mission. I have made your very being known to them. Who you are and what you do. And continue to make it known. So that your love for me. Might be in them. Exactly as I am in them. Jesus, having prayed this prayer, left with his disciples and crossed over the brook Kidron at a place where there was a garden. He and his disciples entered it. Judas, his betrayer, knew the place because Jesus and his disciples went there often. So Judas led the way to the garden, and the Roman soldiers and police sent by the high priests and Pharisees followed. They arrived there with lanterns and torches and swords. Jesus, knowing by now everything that was imploding on him, went out and met them. He said, Who are you after? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene. He said, That's me. The soldiers recoiled, totally taken aback. Judas, his betrayer, stood out like a sore thumb. Jesus asked again, Who are you after? They answered, Jesus the Nazarene. I told you, said Jesus, that's me. I'm the one. So if it's me you're after, let these others go. This validated the words in his prayer, I didn't lose one of those you gave. Just then Simon Peter, who was carrying a sword, pulled it from its sheath and struck the chief priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. 
Malchus was the servant's name. Jesus ordered Peter, put back your sword. Do you think for a minute I'm not going to drink this cup the Father gave me? Then the Roman soldiers under their commander, joined by the Jewish police, seized Jesus and tied him up. They took him first to Annas, father-in-law of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the chief priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it was to their advantage that one man die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. That other disciple was known to the chief priest, and so he went in with Jesus to the chief priest's courtyard. Peter had to stay outside. Then the other disciple went out, spoke to the doorkeeper, and got Peter in. The young woman who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, Aren't you one of this man's disciples? He said, No, I'm not. The servants and police had made a fire because of the cold and were huddled there warming themselves. Peter stood with them, trying to get warm. Annas interrogated Jesus regarding his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I've spoken openly in public. I've taught regularly in meeting places and the temple, where the Jews all come together. Everything has been out in the open. I've said nothing in secret. So why are you treating me like a traitor? Question those who have been listening to me. They know well what I have said. My teachings have all been above board. When he said this, one of the policemen standing there slapped Jesus across the face, saying, How dare you speak to the chief priest like that? Jesus replied, If I've said something wrong, prove it. But if I've spoken the plain truth, why this slapping around? Then Anna sent him, still tied up, to the chief priest Caiaphas. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was back at the fire, still trying to get warm. The others there said to him, Aren't you one of his disciples? He denied it, not me. One of the chief priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. Just then a rooster crowed. They led Jesus then from Caiaphas to the Roman governor's palace. It was early morning. They themselves didn't enter the palace because they didn't want to be disqualified from eating the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and spoke. What charge do you bring against this man? They said, if he hadn't been doing something evil, do you think we'd be here bothering you? Pilate said, you take him. Judge him by your law. The Jews said, we're not allowed to kill anyone. This would confirm Jesus' word indicating the way he would die. Pilate went back into the palace and called for Jesus. He said, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you this about me? Pilate said, Do I look like a Jew? Your people and your high priests turned you over to me. What did you do? My kingdom, said Jesus, doesn't consist of what you see around you. If it did, my followers would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But I'm not that kind of king, not the world's kind of king. Then Pilate said, So, are you a king or not? Jesus answered, You tell me. Because I am king, I was born and entered the world so that I could witness to the truth. Everyone who cares for truth, who has any feeling for the truth, recognizes my voice. Pilate said, What is truth? Then he went back out to the Jews and told them, I find nothing wrong in this man. It's your custom that I pardon one prisoner at Passover. Do you want me to pardon the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Not this one, but Barabbas. 
Barabbas was a Jewish freedom fighter. So Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers, having braided a crown from thorns, set it on his head, threw a purple robe over him, and approached him with, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they greeted him with slaps in the face. Pilate went back out again and said to them, I present him to you, but I want you to know that I do not find him guilty of any crime. Just then Jesus came out wearing the thorn crown and purple robe. Pilate announced, Here he is, the man. When the high priests and police saw him, they shouted in a frenzy, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told them, You take him. You crucify him. I find nothing wrong with him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and by that law he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he became even more scared. He went back into the palace and said to Jesus, Where did you come from? Jesus gave no answer. Pilate said, You won't talk. Don't you know that I have the authority to pardon you, and the authority to crucify you? Jesus said, You haven't a shred of authority over me except what has been given you from heaven. That's why the one who betrayed me to you has committed a far greater fault. At this, Pilate tried his best to pardon him, but the Jews shouted him down, If you pardon this man, you're no friend of Caesar's. Anyone setting himself up as king defies Caesar. When Pilate heard those words, he led Jesus outside. He sat down at the judgment seat in the area designated Stone Court, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day for Passover. The hour was noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted back, Kill him. Kill him. Crucify him. Pilate said, I am to crucify your king. The high priests answered, We have no king except Caesar. Pilate caved into their demand. He turned him over to be crucified. They took Jesus away. Carrying his cross, Jesus went out to the place called Skull Hill, the name in Hebrew is Golgotha, where they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote a sign and had it placed on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was right next to the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The Jewish high priests objected. Don't write, they said to Pilate, the king of the Jews. Make it, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. When they crucified him, the Roman soldiers took his clothes and divided them up four ways, to each soldier a fourth. But his robe was seamless, a single piece of weaving, so they said to each other, let's not tear it up. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. This confirmed the scripture that said, they divided up my clothes among them and threw dice for my coat. The soldiers validated the scriptures. While the soldiers were looking after themselves, Jesus' mother, his aunt, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood at the foot of the cross. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her. He said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that moment the disciple accepted her as his own mother. Jesus, seeing that everything had been completed so that the scripture record might also be complete, then said, I'm thirsty. A jug of sour wine was standing by. Someone put a sponge soaked with the wine on a javelin and lifted it to his mouth. 
After he took the wine, Jesus said, It's done, complete. Bowing his head, he offered up his spirit. Then the Jews, since it was the day of Sabbath preparation, and so the bodies wouldn't stay on the crosses over the Sabbath, it was a high holy day that year, petitioned Pilate that their legs be broken to speed death, and the bodies taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man crucified with Jesus, and then the other. When they got to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers stabbed him in the side with his spear. Blood and water gushed out. The eyewitness to these things has presented an accurate report. He saw it himself and is telling the truth so that you, also, will believe. These things that happened confirmed the scripture, not a bone in his body was broken, and the other scripture that reads, they will stare at the one they pierced. After all this, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he was intimidated by the Jews, petitioned Pilate to take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission. So Joseph came and took the body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus at night, came now in broad daylight carrying a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about seventy-five pounds. They took Jesus' body and, following the Jewish burial custom, wrapped it in linen with the spices. There was a garden near the place he was crucified, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been placed. So, because it was Sabbath preparation for the Jews and the tomb was convenient, they placed Jesus in it. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone was moved away from the entrance. She ran at once to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, gasping for breath. They took the master from the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple left immediately for the tomb. They ran, neck and neck. The other disciple got to the tomb first, outrunning Peter. Stooping to look in, he saw the pieces of linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. Simon Peter arrived after him, entered the tomb, observed the linen cloths lying there, and the kerchief used to cover his head not lying with the linen cloths but separate, neatly folded by itself. Then the other disciple, the one who had gotten there first, went into the tomb, took one look at the evidence, and believed. No one yet knew from the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The disciples then went back home. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she knelt to look into the tomb and saw two angels sitting there, dressed in white, one at the head, the other at the foot of where Jesus' body had been laid. They said to her, Woman, why do you weep? They took my master, she said, and I don't know where they put him. After she said this, she turned away and saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to her, Woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? She, thinking that he was the gardener, said, Sir, if you took him, tell me where you put him so I can care for him. Jesus said, Mary. Turning to face him, she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, meaning, teacher. Jesus said, Don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers and tell them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went, telling the news to the disciples, I saw the Master. And she told them everything he said to her. Later on that day, the disciples had gathered together, but, fearful of the Jews, had locked all the doors in the house. Jesus entered, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he showed them his hands and sighed. 
The disciples, seeing the Master with their own eyes, were awestruck. Jesus repeated his greeting, Peace to you. Just as the Father sent me, I send you. Then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? But Thomas, sometimes called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We saw the Master. But he said, Unless I see the nail holes in his hands, put my finger in the nail holes, and stick my hand in his side, I won't believe it. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the room. This time Thomas was with them. Jesus came through the locked doors, stood among them, and said, Peace to you. Then he focused his attention on Thomas. Take your finger and examine my hands. Take your hand and stick it in my side. Don't be unbelieving. Believe. Thomas said, My Master. My God. Jesus said, So, you believe because you've seen with your own eyes. Even better blessings are in store for those who believe without seeing. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way He personally revealed it. After this, Jesus appeared again to the disciples, this time at the Tiberias Sea, the Sea of Galilee. This is how he did it, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed Twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the brothers Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter announced, I'm going fishing. The rest of them replied, We're going with you. They went out and got in the boat. They caught nothing that night. When the sun came up, Jesus was standing on the beach, but they didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to them, Good morning. Did you catch anything for breakfast? They answered, No. He said, Throw the net off the right side of the boat and see what happens. They did what he said. All of a sudden there were so many fish in it, they weren't strong enough to pull it in. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Master. When Simon Peter realized that it was the Master, he threw on some clothes, for he was stripped for work, and dove into the sea. The other disciples came in by boat for they weren't far from land, a hundred yards or so, pulling along the net full of fish. When they got out of the boat, they saw a fire laid, with fish and bread cooking on it. Jesus said, Bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter joined them and pulled the net to shore, 153 big fish. And even with all those fish, the net didn't rip. Jesus said, Breakfast is ready. Not one of the disciples dared ask, Who are you? They knew it was the Master. Jesus then took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had shown himself alive to the disciples since being raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Master, you know I love you. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. He then asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Master, you know I love you. Jesus said, Shepherd my sheep. Then he said it a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was upset that he asked for the third time, Do you love me? So he answered, Master, you know everything there is to know. 
You've got to know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I'm telling you the very truth now, when you were young you dressed yourself and went wherever you wished, but when you get old you'll have to stretch out your hands while someone else dresses you and takes you where you don't want to go. He said this to hint at the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he commanded, Follow me. Turning his head, Peter noticed the disciple Jesus loved following right behind. When Peter noticed him, he asked Jesus, Master, what's going to happen to him? Jesus said, If I want him to live until I come again, what's that to you? You, follow me. That is how the rumor got out among the brothers that this disciple wouldn't die. But that is not what Jesus said. He simply said, If I want him to live until I come again, what's that to you? This is the same disciple who was eyewitness to all these things and wrote them down. And we all know that his eyewitness account is reliable and accurate. There are so many other things Jesus did. If they were all written down, each of them, one by one, I can't imagine a world big enough to hold such a library of books.